On today's podcast, we're going to be chatting with Shoat Engineering Performance about something that actually really shocked me, which is reman engines and what that really means, specifically when we're talking about OEM reman engines. So they have a lot of details on them, things that they do different with their engines, plus a lot of details as far as coming up with new products and also being able to get them out to you guys or to shops all across the country. So I'm really looking forward to it. Before we get to the podcast, I want to give a shout out to a couple of our sponsors that help make the Diesel Podcast possible. First is Target Sports USA, and if you're anything like me, you also have hobbies outside of diesel trucks, um, whether that's hunting, going to the range, competition. Target Sports USA has a complete lineup of products, and they have a really cool membership program. It lasts one year. During that year, on your when you first sign up, um, if you go to targetsportsusa.com forward slash diesel PC, you get a free cleaning kit on the first order. Plus, there's free shipping whether you want one box or you're getting 20 boxes or even more. And then also there's an instant discount of 8% and a couple times throughout the year, it goes up to 16%. So if, uh, you know, you need to hit the range, need to zero something and just need a couple boxes, it's free shipping or you're stocking up, need a thousand, a thousand rounds, it's free shipping as well. There's also some giveaways that they have that you're automatically entered for. First is an all expense paid hunting trip to Colorado. It's valued at about $45,000. That includes airfare, lodging, accommodations, everything you need. Um, also the licensing. It's a guided tour and it includes complimentary meat processing and it's shipping back to you. So you're automatically entered into that. It's a great way to spend six days in Colorado, have a once in a lifetime hunting trips. Really cool. Plus they give away an F-150 every year. You're automatically entered into that as well. So if you're looking for, you know, a daily driver, you know, something, something else besides your diesel truck, um, it's a great chance to be able to win a free truck. So if you're interested, head on over to targetsportsusa.com forward slash diesel PC, sign up and get some uh, free shipping on your product, get a, a cleaning kit on your first order and enter it into some cool giveaways. Also want to give a shout out to Kershaw Knives and Kershaw Knives has a discount code just for you guys. If you use code 2024diesel40 at kershaw.kaiusa.com, it's a great way to save some money, get some really cool gear. If you need a knife for hunting, fishing, EDC, something around the job site, they've got a ton of different choices for opening mechanisms, uh, blade steel, blade shape, handle materials, and a whole lineup of knives to meet any budget. So if you're in the market, head on over to their site, use code 2024diesel40 for 40% off. All right, let's get to today's podcast. Welcome to the diesel podcast guys i think this is the first one we've ever done where we got three guests at once it's like a almost looks like the brady bunch with the quadrant that we got going on so that's uh that's kind of cool <laughs> it's jam do we, do we like look to the left and then like down and like one of the, i don't know what quadrant i'm going to be in for the recording i don't either yeah, you look like you're poking cast i think that's right <laughs> well it's mm -hmm. uh we, we had some really good conversations recently with you guys about engines and different you know kind of failures and things that are popping up one of the huge questions i always get is somebody when they need an engine they're not into diesel performance they're not into racing they don't they don't really follow you know all the pages or anything like that on social media they just use the truck for work or towing or something like that and they say do i need to go back with a stock engine should i trust that cummins or gm or ford they spend all this time, all this engineering, making this part or that part or making the engine. It's the best on the planet that I can get. I know it's a huge topic, but I wanted to ask you guys, Cass and Adam and, and Ryan, what is, what would you say to that, to somebody who's, you know, the kind of torn thing about getting an OEM engine? Is it the best that you can get? Are there certain components that are great that are OEM? Where can you make improvements in the aftermarket? I um, think to a certain extent, it depends on the platform. I'm sorry, Cass, go ahead. You'll um, know we'll more. Yeah, you, you said exactly what I was going to say. Um, it definitely depends on the platform. It's kind of funny how uh, I think some manufacturers tend to have certain failures um, on certain platforms that they just continue to, to fight that those problems. And then um, you have some, and they're completely different. But that's the funny part of it is like the problems that Ford has is completely different than the problems that Cummins has. The problem that comes out that there's no way, shape, or form, Isuzu or Duramax or GM, uh, they're not related. So it is. And the funny thing is, is again, it's not just that. It's like it's, it's you know six oh six four uh, five nine Cummins, uh, you know LML versus LB seven. It's they're all different. Is it that? And you get some people. I think that's funny that we'll come back and I'm reading comments on some of the other ones that we've done. Guys saying like, 
hey, I've, I've worked on them for 20 years and I've never seen those problems. Okay, well, we're a remanufacturing facility. All we see is engines with problems. You, know, mm -hmm. you might've gotten lucky and worked on them for 20 years and never saw them. All we see is the ones that have problems. So we we, we know a little more than, than, right. than others might just because that, of that. That's the big takeaway I have from you know, these podcasts and talking with you guys is even though the problems might all be varied, there's still problems. They're still, you guys are still building Duramaxes and Power Strokes and Cummins engines. And while they're all a little bit different, you know, they, they kind of have issues. So I thought maybe, I guess we could go down a bunch of different rabbit holes with this. But you say if we're talking about a 6.7 Cummins, kind of keeping it newer. Are there, where's the main weak point or, or the, the upgrades somebody should think for that daily driver towing application that's different than stock? So when they're trying to make this decision between, you know, do I just get an OEM reman or, or do I go aftermarket? What should they pay attention to? I'm going to let you guys do the tech stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I, I, I think, go ahead. But I would just say this is like, when you start understanding kind of the OEM, um, world, like when you've gone to tier one suppliers and you start realizing how many OEM parts are actually aftermarket components or made by aftermarket companies, uh, whether it be Dana making your differentials or it be another company making torque converters or turbochargers like whole set, that type of thing. You realize that uh, OEM um, has always in their first mind is scalability. Um, I think, you know, someone said you can always make one thing really good one time, but manufacturing is a whole different ball of wax. Um, so what turbocharger you use, what piston you use, what connecting rod you use, what displacement you have in that engine, all has to fit around so many parameters between marketing, horsepower claims, things like that, that yes, the guys are completely right that depending on the platform, they have their own shortcomings that shortcoming might be because of an outside factor. It could be from a tier one supplier. Um, it could be from the fact that they needed to hit a certain emissions that year versus uh, a year prior. Um, there are so many limiting factors. The OEM is so handcuffed when it comes to their production just because of the, the scale of it. Um, and that is where the aftermarket comes in. We have the big over the top advantage is that while we are scaled up and we build things and we're manufacturers, we are much more nimble than the OEM. We can choose the parts that are best suited for that platform to fix all their smaller deficiencies. So six, seven Cummins, I'm sure is a great example. And this is where I'll let Cass be the smart one in the room. But um, I have a brand I work with that is a tier one supplier for uh, uh, one of the domestics and uh it's interesting uh, going through that process and going to Dearborn and meeting those guys and just the scale of this business. I mean, all of Detroit is built around building the domestics. It is jaw dropping, but in something that large and bureaucratic, et cetera, just like our wonderful government, that type of thing, things can be missed. Things will be missed. Things will be low quality. Um, so anyway, I'll let you run with that cast, but I figured I'd just poke in there real quick. No, I mean, you're, you're hundred percent right. Scalability uh, and cost, you know, is everything for an OE because, you know, for us, we might manufacture 600 engines a year or something like that, but uh, the OE are, are doing, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of these and, you know, every dime counts for them. And uh, they have whole groups of people that uh, are working on saving a nickel an engine um, because it, it makes so much of a difference for us. Our, our um, approach is a lot different. Um, my approach, and this sounds so trite and cheesy that it's cheesy, but our approach is to put out the best possible product that I can um, and figure out ways that, okay, I can tell you it was funny. I, I went to a, I, I went to a um, remanufacturer that does, uh, I won't mention the name, but they're one of the big three and they supply all the engines for um, this for this OE for their reman program. So if you went, you went to the dealership, you asked them, um, you know, I needed a new engine. You would get actually, you're not getting a Ford engine or a Chevrolet engine or Dodge or whatever, or Cummins or PowerShot Duramax. You're not getting that. What on the reman side, uh, you, what you're getting is another company that has bid that job. Um, and that's another thing that a lot of people don't understand because I'll hear guys go, I got a crate engine from GM or whatever. No, actually I've been there. No, you didn't. 
um, you got an engine that was manufactured a couple of states over kind of thing, right? Um, and they've never, it's, it's not the same company. But uh, they asked me my, you know, what I did and, and because I, they asked me to come up to help them on a program. Um, and so I went up there and they asked me a little bit about um, what kind of engines we manufactured. And I started talking to them about, you know, some of the fixes that we were doing and different things like that. And one engineer turned to the other guy and he goes, huh. So you manufacture a product, you try to fix all the problems and market that as a, you know, as a much better engine to the customer by selling a better product. And he looks at the guy and he goes, hmm, what a, what a nominal approach, you know, just, you know, what a thought, who would have thought that, right? It's so foreign to them to think in terms of, you know, we're going to fix the problem and then we're going to market to that group of people. Um, we're not looking for guys that are wanting the cheapest thing that they can possibly hobble together. We're looking for guys that are using these vehicles that need these things every day. And they, they don't want the same garbage that they had before because they're already frustrated with it. Uh, and so I look at every aspect of the engine of any failure point. When I hear failure point, I mean, that's where I really perk up because that's where I go in and I go, okay, all right, what are we going to do to fix this? You know, everybody in the company has their position and their role. For me, it's the engineering and the, the designing and, and stuff like that. Um, but it's just, it's truly, it's the mindset of the company and it's, it's driven by, it, it truly is, it's driven by the dollar. And and, and everybody, it, you know, if we made this whole engine out of stainless, 304 stainless steel, and I mean, you know, at some point we got to go, this is just not going to be feasible. It's not going to be marketable. We can't put out billet blocks for everybody. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but there's a ton of stuff that we can do to make them better and still affordable. You were talking platform specific. Um I can touch on that a little bit like the new 19 Cummins like that's we did a whole video on that that's got its whole list of issues but you go back a little further um you've got valves valve seat issues in the Cummins um that fell out on certain years um you go back into like six seven power stroke they have valve failure issues where the valve itself fails um, I mean, the 6.0 has got its whole own list. I mean, that's a whole separate podcast on its own. Uh, same with the 6.4. Um, I'm trying to think. 7.3. Yeah. 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 Um, 7.3 has some valve. It, no, 7.3 is the valves actually beat up the head and push themselves further into the head. Right? I'm saying that correctly? The valve yes. margin. Yeah, it, it well, it wears below the valve margin, but yeah, the valves were. Um, but I'm gonna tell you, I mean, that engine just really and truly, I mean, you know, you're a 73 guy, that's your, you know, that's your uh baby. But those engines, really and truly, they just they were pretty much indestructible for what they uh what they were built for. But keep in mind, you know, again, the difference is is that you're going from uh, a platform that was made by International that was intended to go into mini medium duty class four you know, design just no different than the ISB, you know, Case and Cummins worked together um, to bring that, you know, to happen, but that was an industrial engine. And that's where we're really moving away from the diesel engine uh, era that we all kind of grew up, you know, in with the industrial application engine being stuck between the frame rails of a pickup truck is now no longer because we are trying to, now we're thinking about weight savings. We're totally thinking about everything emissions uh, we're take, t talking about noise abatement, like NVH and noise vibration harshness. There's a lot of things that have to get considered now. It's not, you, you know, it's those days have, have gone. Uh, and and so there's a lot more uh, advancements in some way and in some ways, lack of uh, reliability. A huge thing you guys, all, all three of you touched on, I think can be missed by the average the average truck owner as you think of going to buy a new vehicle or whenever i've gone in to buy a new one i am sold on that truck and that engine based on the marketing of that company um whether it's something in the dealership with a cummins like display engine or you know, something like that or the parts that are shown or i've seen the commercial or, or the ads on the internet and so i have this thing that i carry with me all the time i think ford did an amazing job on this six seven or GM and you know, Isuzu did this amazing job on this Duramax or Cummins. 
you know, they put all this time and effort there, you know, known all over the world for their diesel engines. So when I come to that failure, kind of in the back of my mind, I'm pre-programmed to think, well, I need to go back with that because that's why I bought this whole truck. That's why I went this direction. So what you mentioned, Cass, with how when you think you're getting this reman engine right off the assembly line in, you know, Columbus, Indiana or Dearborn or wherever it is, you're actually not. That's something the average person, I didn't know that. I thought they actually came from, they just pull one off, you know, the assembly line when they're making the six seven power struggle. Like, okay, this one's for Patrick. So I think that's something we should spend a little bit more time on is talking about that because I think in the aftermarket, like Ryan mentioned, the scalability, how much time you guys can put into making a better engine for those 600 customers per year is way different than Ford cranking out 700,000 or a million and figuring out if we say four cents per part on this, this turns into millions by the end of the year. We don't necessarily think about that as a truck owner. Well, and to kind of highlight a little bit of what you're saying there is um, Choate is my um, newest brand that I'm working with. Um, I've worked with everything around the engine, but never the actual thing that makes it go. Transmission, turbochargers, you name it, um, differential components. So it's really exciting for me to work for a company that deals with the, the heart of, of uh, your truck. Um, and just the process that they've put in, when you say that, you know, what can we actually do for those 600 customers? I don't think most people know that there's over three to 400 photos taken of your engine when it comes from tear down all the way to it being dynoed and it going into a crate. Every torque spec, if there's a gasket, a bearing, anything replaced in there, you get a photograph of it from start to finish. Um, it's, it's almost like, you know, having a pregnancy or something like that. You're just documenting it all the way through. And that was one thing that I really appreciated about um, working with Choke because I, I over my career I've been in the diesel truck space for years. I have worked with companies that source their products. Like, hey, we have you know this guy that casts this, and we bring it in, and we do some machining. And I've worked with companies that truly take raw metal and turn it into something you can put on your truck or. Uh, something that um, Choate does, and and like I said, it's it's a it's an interesting machine. Their facility is impressive. Um, it is it's awesome. It was just awesome doing the tour and seeing the the care that they put into each, each engine. And that's why I wanted to work with them. Um, that's why I wanted to um, to be able to go out, uh, meet dealers, meet potential customers at uh, our tr our shows. So like this year, Choate's going to be out at a bunch of events and and going and seeing people and educating them, but um, like you said, Pat, you know, what kind of, uh, what, what can we do? You know, uh, how, how far can we take this care into each build? Cause we have, you know, we don't have to make 8 million of these things. If we yeah. need to make a $10 decision on everyone's engine, that's going to cost us 6,000 bucks. What's it going to cost for $10 million? Like yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a big deal. So for us, we can make 10 and 20 and hundred dollar decisions for the better of our customer like that. Like it, may, it makes no sense for us to, to ever do that. So, but what is the OEM actually good at that? That may be the best question to ask. What, what are they good at that we fall down on? Right. And for, for us and, and when I come into any, you know, brand and, and start looking at, Hey, where's, where's their blind spot. Cause just like Cass said, Hey, I'm an engineer. Like uh, I think in his last podcast, he says, I've done well in business, but I'm not a business person. Um, you know, I just, I like making something better and new. I'm kind of the same way when it comes to like um, how the customer per perceives a, a brand or a dealer would interact with a brand. And so uh, what I think Ford or any of the three does very well is their their national feel, right? So if you have an injector go down, I can stop by Patrick Ellis Ford, you know, tomorrow and I'm, I'm in good shape, right? Um, so we are trying to bring those same types of consistency um that nationwide feel um to choat and that's kind of our our new adventure this year so we've been able to have this boutique shop that we can take 300 plus photos of your engine that arrives you know at your desired shop or your front door um and but how do we take that um kind of carefully crafted thing and give you that 
that big footprint feel um, that you've got this big national warranty behind you. You've got this network of dealers that you can take your truck to if there's ever an issue, or you know you're going to get the best installation possible. So that's what we are creating and building right now. Um, and everything came down to data, bombs, all the stuff that Adam gets kind of fixing. So while Cass has created a great product, how you execute that's everything. I mean, Red Hat Linux was the best operating system in the world, but Microsoft crushed them because they executed better. They took a, a product that was about half as good and they absolutely beat them into the dirt. So, you know, we, we don't want to see that happen. I'm Ford is still going to outpace us every year on remanufactured engines, but um, how can we, how can we win a little bit more of that piece of the pie? And I think they figured out the what, uh, the how is what we're we're working on right now. Well, and you think about that too, like not to beat up on the OEMs too much. There's there's no way that if we were to create a vehicle from scratch, create you know all the engineering of all that, that it would be affordable. So I mean, and there's no way that we would have our we have our business as does just about everyone else that's been on this podcast or everyone else that's you know because the OEMs have been able to scale and, and, you know, take, I don't know, millions of hours of R and D and turn it into something that we all can go out and buy. I mean, I guess this is kind of an obvious comment, but I feel like we're beating up on the OEMs too much. <laughs> no, they keep needing to make stuff that breaks so we can make money. <laughs> <laughs> well, they made a perfect vehicle. We'd all be out of a job, man. <laughs> <laughs> I really want another 6.0 because, uh, man, how many millionaires did that thing make? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the huge um, part with this. Because the, the, the question people ask is, well, how quickly can I get it? And that's where I've seen a massive change over the years with what used to, what I used to think was a reasonable lead time. It's in some places it's even longer now. Or then the questions turn into, well, what am I, am I buying the same thing? So I think being able to get the idea, the product, the engineering out there faster, not only helps the guy who needs it to get back to work, but then like you mentioned, Ryan, with the shops where they're seeing 50, 60 trucks a week or however many they're seeing, mm -hmm. they need to be able to get that quick or they're going to go, Ford can get me one or GM can get me one, you know, in a couple days. But what do you, what is a customer really getting? Are they getting the same thing that they had before that is going to fail or you're going to have an issue with? I would say one of the things I've, uh, it's been interesting uh, being in the transmission industry and then seeing some uh, equivalent things in the engine um, remanufacturing process, even though they're very different, there are uh, some similarities. I would think your average listener, if you were to call in to Chote or talk to one of our dealers, we don't ask you how much horsepower you want to make whenever um, you're buying an engine. We say, what do you do? Like, what do you do with your truck? Oh, you pull really heavy? Okay. Um, whereas a transmission, uh, if somebody says, hey, I'm looking to buy a transmission, I instantly go, well, how much horsepower is a thing making? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I need to know what stage I'm going to put you in because you're shoving power into my transmission box, right? Now, our engines get to live on an island. We just need to know what that whole truck is doing, and then you can you can put your componentry on it after that. And I think that is a big difference maker, and it should tell your viewers what kind of brand that Chote is and how they, you know, what their core values are is delivering something that, yes, we want to get it to you as quickly as possible. Yes, we want to support it nationally, but what are you doing with the truck and what, you know, failures do we need to fix before you put it into where it's going to last as long as possible? Um, and I, I, like, again, that's, that's kind of one of the things why I got excited about them, why I wanted to work with them because they, they ask the right question when somebody calls in and it's shopping an engine is not like, Hey, you want to make 800 horsepower? Um, I mean, we can do that, I suppose, but, uh, we really want to know, you know, Hey, do you pull 30,000 pounds? Do you pull 10? Do you have a jet ski? That's all you're doing with this. You know, how long do you expect to keep the truck? Those are the kind of questions we're asking. We're not asking somebody, um, you know, you know, what kind of burnouts you're going to do and things like that. And that's been a, a refreshing thing from coming from selling turbochargers and transmissions is I don't have to chase that, that horsepower torque goal. I just uh, I get to chase some reliability and what, you know, what people are actually doing with their vehicle. Well, that's why we have the different levels too. You know, so we've got our Model C, which is essentially a, a crate motor from, I know we just, 
talk negatively about crate motors from from Ford and GM, but it's it's essentially that, just with the fixes of the common problems. And then it goes up from there to a balanced engine to workhorse engine, which is more commercial, uh, commercially built. You know, it comes with um, heavy duty pistons, a different cam, um, as well as all those other fixes. And then you get into how much horsepower do you want to make? And that's the cast watch engine, which is our race engine. And you say that I'm working with a guy right now. We're building a 1200 horsepower 6.0. Um, so we go all the way from the Model C, which is our, you know, crate motor with or our Ford crate motor or whatever Cummins crate motor essentially with fixes um all the way up to a 1200 horsepower 60 that we're building right now which I know 1200 doesn't sound like much but remember I said 60 so <laughs> um, it's yeah it's all over the place what are some examples you guys would give as to the fixes I know there's probably hundreds of them or maybe even thousands of them for all the engines of all the years and I know we'd be here for probably three days doing a podcast, but what are some that you would you would highlight with any of the engines? Is there something you guys are working on, something that's new, something that me as a truck owner, if I called in and I had this particular engine, I'd say, you know what, that's going to, I'm going to go this route. I'm going to go this direction versus, you know, this other one. I think that'll help people understand the aftermarket a bit better and the way you guys approach it versus a mass produced reman or, you know, OEM engine. Cass, you want to show him your latest uh, find? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and he's right. And it's a good way of putting it because it always is a find. Um, anytime we have a failure, it is, uh, it is. we want to know exactly why it failed. We want to know, is this a pattern or is this a one-time instance? There's there's always a reason why something fails. Um, I was talking to um, John over at BD this, this last uh, week, I guess it was, and uh, anyways, we were talking about some different failures and points and things. And I went into one of their uh, their uh, training seminars that they were doing. And it was, it was a really good time because we got to talk about uh, failures are probably one of my favorite things to talk about. I know that sounds crazy, but I enjoy it because it tells a story. Um, even I will tell you, you're going to think I'm absolutely crazy. My wife and I were sitting at the table and like a couple nights ago and we just built a house. And uh, anyways, there we had an issue with the doorknob. And so we took the thing off and it, it's been I've been working really, really. There's so many honeydew things on my list. It's pathetic. But anyways, the mirror fell down. And so I began to think, I mean, this is just the way, that the, the way my mind works. Was it humidity that was being pulled in from so and so that was causing the adhesive from the backing of the strip to cause the mirror to fall down? You know, it's just that's the nature of, of, of the way that we think. Um, but anyways, to get to my point, the latest failure um, is always fun when you find out, you know, something to be so. But then when you find a little bit of evidence on it, then you really it's, it's kind of fun because you get the confirmation. Of it. So you're probably not gonna be able to see this, but I'm going to show you two different bolts. And this is on the six, seven power stroke. And this was changed. They changed this bolt, I think, to around 2017. Um, and I wish I had, well, it wouldn't matter because you wouldn't be able to see it. I'm going to hold up the camera. The first bolt that we see is, this is a bolt that holds the rocker arm assembly on, okay? And this is an M6 1.0 bolt, okay? So it's, it's a one millimeter thread pitch and it's an M6. So for guys that aren't metric guys, um, you're looking at something around, I think this bolt right here, the shaft diameter, and I'm going to really try to get close to it. The shaft diameter is around 210 thousandths, 203 thousandths, and it's a straight shaft. This bolt with the head, the large head on it, okay, this thing became, became a problem for Ford. And I've said this a million times in different uh, seminars and things, how you know Ford knew about it, but wasn't going to tell you anything about it is because they don't change the part number. If they change the part number, that's an admission of guilt. What we do is we change the engineering number so that the consumer knows nothing about it, but we tweak the design. All right. So this is the next bolt that you'll see. This is an inverted Torx. What you'll notice about this bolt is that it has a transition at the threads. So it's a taper. This bolt, the shaft is actually 20 thousandths thicker than this bolt here. And you can actually tell probably from looking at it, the one, yeah. the one on the left is a little bit thicker. Okay. 
Now, the grade of this bolt is a 10.9. The grade of this is an 8.8. .8. So that has megapascals. That's the difference in uh, in the strength of the bolt and its um, elasticity, basically, its ability to, to stretch. Now, there are anybody that's ever worked on these trucks knows there's basically there's three of these little M6 1.0 bolts. And what happens is, is it breaks. And where it breaks, it breaks right where the threads and the head or excuse me, the uh, the shaft come together and it snaps and it causes the rocker arm to fa fall. Okay, if you go back to the predecessor, the, two th the 2008 to 2010 6.4 liter or the 6.0 or even the smallest bolt that I think they've ever used on a 7.3, they used four of them, but they were an M8 1.25. This is a bolt that's on a 6.4. This is a bolt that's on a 6.7. It's insane that yeah. there would be that much difference in this, but they knew they had a failure. They changed it with the other bolt bolt that we, we said they changed the engineering number. They never gave it a part number because it came as an assembly. So what we do to fix that problem is we've got a tool that, um, oh shoot, I wish I had one in here. We've got a tool now that is going to bolt. If, if you've got an in-service repair, um, you can bolt on to the rocker assembly and it'll help you to pilot drill everything out so that everything gets put back in the right place. And we we're upgrading these things now to M8 1.25 bolt. But the bolts that we had made for us are actually a 12.9 grade bolt. So it's much, much uh, stronger bolt. It's uh, got about a hundred thousandths thicker. Um, and it, here's the problem. Guys are coming out and putting bigger camshafts in these things too. So you have this fulcrum that the rocker arm is exerting, you know, a, a, basically a dynamic load all the time that you're seeing in this. And this thing is rotating, you know, or at least having forces acted on it about 1,250 times if they're running 2,500 RPMs, but say 2,000 RPMs. It's, it's seeing this thing half that much because it's a camshaft, so 1,000 times a minute that you're having this force applied. And then on top of that, you have four rockers for each assembly and you've got 78, 80 pound valve springs. So that's no different than what the 6.4 did, but they, they designed this bolt to hold that. So that shows you, um, again, going back to what we originally said, we'll fix that problem to us. I don't care. It's a, you know, if the bolt costs me a dollar more, so what? I don't care. Just fix it. Because if the guy's on the side of the road, but they're, figuring out the how far they can take something down, how much weight, we saw that with Cummins, how much weight can we take out of this thing and still be able to put out a product that will just get us out of warranty? So those are one of the, I mean, that's just one of the fixes. And that's that's the one, that's the fix of the week um, that we found around here that we're working on. But I thought it was pretty interesting um, seeing the transition that it was identified by Ford because of the change in the bolt and the change in, you know, the engineering number. Well, and these fixes come as the engines not evolve, but as they age. Um, like I've seen a few things just in the last year that I've been here that we learned later on because the trucks are essentially getting to the age to where those things are starting to fail. They weren't failing when the castings were newer or, you know, um, they weren't failing when it was a newer engine. No, but they're starting to now. I feel like that is something that I've only seen over the last few months, but I've seen it a lot over the last few months of those bolts breaking. Um, I don't know, just interesting to see it evolve. Um, but you say that, you, Patrick, you wanted the list. So the six, seven valves snap in the in the power stroke. So we put different valves in there that aren't designed that way. Uh, seven, three, we're actually machining the valve seats out and putting bigger hardened seats and everything doing that for the Cummins as well, because the Cummins has those issues. Um, Cass made uh, billet steel mains for the six, seven, um, cause those are an issue. Um, gosh, what else, what am I missing? There's so many, well, you know, uh, yeah. If you just want to walk down the, the line, obviously, you know, it's the uh, fixes that we're doing now with key crank on the Duramaxes, which has always been a problem. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things that we do differently with the, the Ford platform with pistons on the 6.4 or even, you know, something as simple as head studs is standard. And that goes back to the whole thing. I think I saw a question or, or maybe, uh, Adam, you sent me something about stock is not an option. Right. Um, and that's that's our motto. And the reason why we use that as a, as a motto is because even as he was saying with a crate engine that we're selling, it's not stock. 
nothing you get from us is stock. Um, it's not like you went to the Ford dealer or the GM dealer or Cummins or Ram or Fiat or whatever um, and said, hey, I want another engine. That's a stock engine. Matter of fact, and I'll tell you a dirty little secret, um, The some of the companies that do reman. Okay, so I was at one place and they're, they're remanufacturing an engine for a big OE. They're taking the heads off and throwing them in the trash because they the OE sends them new heads. And then I said, what are you doing about surfacing the block? And they said, well, we run brushes across it. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, the OE will not let us take any material off. I said, but what if it's warped? He said, well, if it's warped beyond spec, we have to throw away the whole block. I said, but you still can't get it flat because, I mean, every block seasons. Like, for instance, when we buy machine tools, Makino, Haas, Mazak, you name it, Akuma, Morisiki, whoever you want to say, what they do in their castings is, and you can check me on this. I mean, everybody, every one of them do, do it. They buy castings. Haas, I know, uh, will leave their castings out for a year outside. And the reason why is because castings shift and they have to settle. And a block does the same thing, especially a new block. And those, I mean, it's just a casting. It's not, it's a very porous material anyways, when you consider it, you know, considering it versus something like a billet. So I said, but this, there's twist. There's, I mean, you've got to think every 90 degrees of rotation, this thing's going, it's got an explosion happening. There's a lot of stuff going on in an engine. The thing's essentially trying to blow itself apart the entire time you're driving it. Um, it's contained blasts. That's all it is. And so I said, well, how, I mean, there's twist and there's bow and there's warp. All of those things are going to happen. He said, well, if they're within spec, you know, and I understand that there is a within a tolerance, but we're not talking within the same tolerances that we would use, especially when you're considering that you're paying that much money for a new engine, but brushes over the top of it. That's just insanity. I would never would have, you know, I would have thought, man, that's absolutely crazy. If that was, um, Anybody else telling me that, you know, I just, but that's, we don't do that. We have uh, a different specification that we hold in our machining practices, um, different RAs, different RK, RKs, RPKs, RVKs, all surface finishes for the cylinder wall, um, all fixes that we have there, balanced rotational assemblies. There's OEs out there that are getting their stuff. Um, okay. I'll tell you another one, uh, six, seven power stroke. There's two different crankshafts in that thing. There's a lot of guys out there that are production engineering builders that don't do anything about that. Now, there's a reason why there's five pounds difference. If you want to know, one weighs 87 pounds, the other weighs 92 pounds. The reason why is the, rota the rotational mass is different because of piston weight, because they went from a 34 millimeter to a 35 millimeter, and then they changed the rods on top of it. These guys are taking and mixing and matching the crankshafts because they don't weigh them, and they certainly don't balance them. And they'll stick one crankshaft in another, and they'll crisscross them. And so you've got a rotational assembly that's five pounds out of balance. Will it fail? No, probably not. I mean, it's going to get you probably going to get you out of warranty. Uh, is it going to run as smooth as what it did when you first bought it? No, it will not. Um, is it going to run as smooth? And this, and then they bore the engine and then add another 20 over 30 over 40 over piston. So this thing's really out of balance. Well, what are the adverse conditions of that? Well, bearing life is not going to be as good as what it initially was. Um, throttle response, the smoothness of throttle response, loss of power, it's because there's parasitic loss of the power. When you have something out of balance, there has a certain, uh, there's a certain vector of, of, uh, of, of, of parasitic loss or drag there um, because it is going into, it's attempting to go into an orbit. Um, so all those things, but there's, there's tons of different fixes that I could go through and, and, and tell you about, but those are just some things I'm rattling off the top of my head. I think the, the biggest takeaway that uh, that I have from it is most people, they don't focus on that. I don't answer the phones like, you know, or, or interact with customers like you do, Adam, or I don't visit shops like you have, Ryan, or, or know, you know, know the technical specs like, like CAS and engineer parts. But when I think about ordering an engine, my mind goes to, okay, am I doing billet rods? What am I doing with the camshaft? How big of a turbo am I, am I throwing on this? What kind of injectors? What kind of CP3? You'd mentioned transmissions, Ryan. So what kind of transmission do I need? Do I need billet shafts? What am I going with? I'm not thinking of the diameter of a bolt and all these other components and RA finishes and all the, I'm not thinking about that, but I should 
before I invest this money and go with an engine. And I think that's what the aftermarket has lacked a lot is like a conversation like this where you can really kind of, I think just understand it better, you know, from the business side of why are they doing this? But then from a practical point of view is I can do better. I can get better. Um, I can, I can have a better product. So it's just, it's, it's eye opening to me. It's a lot of this I didn't know. And I'm a consumer too. So, you know, I look at the big shiny turbo and the injectors and the transmission and, you know, the fueling and all that. I'm not thinking about bolt size, but how that can lead to a catastrophic failure. But you guys are. Uh, I mean, like I said, that's one of the great things about um, that organization is they're building something that it may not be as glitz and glamour and cool, but it, it everything that there is important. You have no idea how hard it was for me to convince people that regearing your truck was one of the best things you could do for the whole truck. If you you know keeping the RPMs where they need to be for the turbo, for the transmission, for the rotating assembly, everything. It's it's literally that one little fuse, and it's just you can't see it. It's not cool. We yeah. sell more diff covers than we sell uh, uh, actual differential components. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's a silly thing. It may not be as glamorous um, as far as the average consumer. People may not be as excited to buy it. But knowing that the little details are taken care of makes your experience just that much better. It's like staying in like a really nice hotel. When all those little details and then you go to somewhere place that's kind of one of those your door opens to the world type of things, you're like, Man, like they just were firing on all cylinders or like going out to eat. You go someplace where they just they handle every little thing. And that's kind of the thing with like a Chote engine. So, you know, we like what Cass said at the beginning, we aren't the cheapest. We we don't really have an equivalent to an OEM crate engine. I guarantee you Cass is going to lose that bid for OE tier one supplier every time because he's just not willing to run brushes over the top of, of the cylinder. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, it's a really cool, uh, really cool organization to be a part of. I'm really excited to work with you guys. You know, where we pay attention to stuff now is started, man, I won't tell you, our company has changed in such drastic ways in the last year and a half, two years. And it's exciting to see because of the level of, of the team that we're putting together. And that's really exciting for me being able to, you know, even if you were Sandy Koufax, okay. Which, or Nolan Ryan, or you pick one, Greg Maddox, whoever you want to, uh, uh, the ones that, you know, uh, guys will remember out there, but if you don't have anybody to catch you, you know, um, you've got a little league out there that's just trying to catch the ball. It's no fun pitching. Right. But when you have a team that's like, you know, yeah, I know I can throw it because he'll catch it, you know, um, that's when it starts getting fun for me. But some of the things that we do now that, you know, and we every day our company changes and changes for the better. Um, the company we were a year ago is, is not the company we are today. And the company we'll be tomorrow is not the same as the one we are today. It's getting it constantly is improving. But what we do, um, we when we get like, for instance, we had a full running assembly. Uh, purchased today that came in like a full pullout, everything with the wiring harness, everything. We'll take that entire engine and completely reverse engineer it. We will measure every single bolt that comes out of it. Because we have to create a bill of material on anything anyways. But we will find not only the casting numbers, because casting numbers are getting to the point now where they don't mean anything. Um, and they don't want there to be traceability. They, the OE does not want you to know anything. They don't want you remanufacturing that. They want you to throw away and get another one or go back to them. Um, and I heard Elon Musk talking about somebody telling him why his car company was going to fail. And he said 80% of, of car companies, uh, when they sell vehicles, which I find hard to believe, talking about they're selling at, a, you know, at basically break-even margins because they're selling the parts to fix these things, right? And Elon said, well, you know, we are a startup business. We don't have 10 years of cars or 20 years of cars on the road to support that they need our parts and things like that. Um, so what we have to do is because the OE has gotten so secretive about the things that they don't want you to know is it's not just about casting numbers anymore. What we have to do is we have to identify features of the part, certain little nuances that change. So that's the reason why I'm over here going, ah, this bolt's 20,000, you know, different over here versus over here. Um, and it's a lot easier when it, you know, you got a big red arrow pointing to it saying, here's a failure, you know, then you go, oh, wait a minute, let me look at this and why it's failing. 
Um, but we have to be able to teach our people how to identify these parts. And a lot of times, like I say, you can't go off of a part number. You have to understand what that feature, why that little nuance has changed. That's the reason why we know that the crankshaft is five pounds difference. How can we make sure? I mean, nobody's out there with bathroom scales weighing up crankshafts. I can promise you that. But, you know, we're out there just, just checking every single thing that we possibly can. Um and that's a, a lot of the reasons why we get, you know, we do get invited a lot to to production engine rebuilders um, around the U.S. because they want to know this stuff. Uh, it's a lot of work to figure it out. It's that's why I love doing podcasts because this information to get all three of you guys in the same room or be at the same event and then to broadcast it out to people would be so hard to do. But this is information I don't know or don't get and. It goes back to that education part, being able to transfer knowledge and information to the people who drive these millions of trucks on the road. I wanted to ask you, Adam, as far as talking with people, is how do you find people respond when, you know, maybe they call up kind of the way that we started this podcast and I say, hey, I can get this, you know, reman engine from the dealership or I can get this series from you guys. Are they really receptive? Are they kind of shocked when they hear the differences and the upgrades that go into something or how do they react to it? I think most people I talk to um, understand that we are not, that we are better than a stock engine. Um, the biggest thing that influences a buyer that, yeah, they want the upgraded and most of them are usually willing to spend a couple grand more to get an upgraded. Um, the biggest thing that I'm seeing is lead time. If this is someone working with their truck, or even if it's just your daily driver, whatever it is, you're in a rental car, you're in a rental truck, or you're just not working while that thing's down. Um, so <sighs> I guess I'm going to lead that into, that's one of the biggest things we're looking at right now. And the big home runs that we've had in the last several months, a lot of this is, is Ryan, honestly. Um, but I mean, I'm not saying it's not everyone else. Um, manufacturing can ebb and flow. You know, we, we're still having supply issues as a country. Um, finding part, you know, having parts disappear for three months is very real. Um, the way to fix that is to build up stock when you have the parts um, or build, you know, find ways to fix used parts or whatnot when you don't have the parts. Um, two things we're working on, but biggest thing right now we're signing up dealers left and right and we're signing up stocking dealers um biggest one that ryan just closed uh apg um so apg is now you know was formerly premier performance for you guys who don't understand what apg is it's a it's a very big wholesale distributor in the industry and they're now stocking our stuff um we've got uh, diesel works uh, a company out of uh oh man this is horrible i want to say they're out of texas um texas. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I was going to kick myself if I got that wrong. Um, they're stocking our stuff. So, and we now have 30 engines in production that are designed purely just to sit on our shelves. Um, so for that contractor that you know, needs to get his truck back on the road, um, it is getting better. The lead times are getting less. Um, it's not something that happens overnight, but it's, um, it is very, it's quickly moving that direction. Having APG stocking our stuff you know means a lot of guys can get an engine well however long it takes to get it to their door um, well and that that's kind of the nice thing that um adam and uh cass and his team have designed is um I don't want to say they oversimplified it, but you can get that analysis paralysis when it comes to the different options uh, when you're buying anything. So, you know, turbochargers, what size wheel is in the exhaust and, you know, what color do I want the compressor cover, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they made it really simple. Like I said, they they kind of lined it out at the, the onset. We have our Model C, then you've got your daily driver and the workhorse. And what I find extremely interesting is the workhorse is kind of your your premium remanufactured engine. I mean, you've got aftermarket cam, you've got loads of bill of parts in this. This is a, this is not an inexpensive build, but it's our number one seller. It is our number one seller because we believe in that engine because our guys, when we're talking to our dealers and we're training them and we're letting them know what comes in everything, the daily driver is probably what I would need, but I'm still buying a workhorse just because I know it's got that little extra flair that Cass put in. He goes, you know what? If I was going to build myself an engine, 
this is the engine I built. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if I'm just, if I'm using this as a work truck, this is the engine I'm building, that type of thing. We have other options. Um, but I, like I said, I find it interesting, but that makes it easy for us to stock. That makes it easy for us to build sub assemblies. So if you want to go short block or long block or a full running engine, it makes us easy to be nimble where the OEs can't catch us and the OEs can't provide the service that we can provide. So the only thing I saw that was missing, um, like I mentioned before, was, you know, we want to make sure our core policy is very easy. And we now have a no questions asked core. It's fifteen hundred bucks. It's one of the cheapest in the industries. And as long as the block isn't windowed and you can rotate the thing, we give you your core money back. Most of your other remanufacturers in the industry, that core charges anywhere between three to four thousand dollars. And if one bearing is missing and this is rod is bent and uh, you know this little piece is is missing, this clip is gone, you can start getting dinged a hundred bucks, fifteen hundred bucks, seven hundred bucks. It's all over the place, and it's such a headache for the customer to have not only forked over thousands of dollars for an engine, but is expecting say $3,500 back and ends up getting maybe $2,000 back because they don't know you're talking witchcraft to them when you're doing something like this. Um, you know, one of the cool things Premier does, if you're a, a dealer with them, if you're within a hundred miles of one of their warehouses, they have a roadie service. They can deliver your engine for much better rates. So logistically we wanted to get better. So those are some of the pain points where you know, maybe Cass is not thinking about those types of things or Adam's not thinking about those things because he's busy working on videos and marketing content and running our sales teams where I'm like, OK, how does the customer get their hands on this thing? And what happens if something goes wrong? How do we make this slick and easy? Because that's what consumers demand these days. They they demand that whatever the easiest product there is to buy out there where there's no questions asked on the warranty you can find it on every shelf in america imagine going into walmart that had nothing on the shelves ever that type of thing the business would fail right so we have to hold ourselves at the same standard and i've mentioned this on the podcast before we are fighting the only buy out there is our customer's wallet their bank account they, there's no infinitely wealthy person out there that we're necessarily necessarily selling engines to so i'm fighting apple samsung you name it for for those bucks you know maybe they're gonna go buy a cheaper remanufactured engine so they could buy that brand new tv we have to build the experience the value and have the dealer network around us and availability for people to say yes i'm gonna i'm gonna go i'm gonna buy the the better item and i think that's what choke hits the nail on the head on literally checks every box well, that's the biggest thing is how quickly can i get it and i'm sure from the shop owner perspective with so many trucks it's not just one guy it's 50 to 70 to however many that question always comes down to how quickly can I get it? Yeah. <laughs> well, usually, I mean, that's a big buying decision for a lot of guys. You know, they might buy a, a number of things just depending on what and when they can get it. So, you know, that's, like I said, that's the nice thing about um, a chote that's new, that if uh, maybe you'd shop the brand um, a few years back and they were telling you eight weeks, 10 weeks, a few months. Now it's, well, where do you live? Well, we've got six on the shelf. Um, you know, we can make sure that we're uh, that kind of consumer experience that they're looking for. Very cool. You guys got a lot going on there. Engineering, distribution, <laughs> a ton of different things. Well, we got a good, like I said, I, and I can't emphasize that enough, but we do really have, um, we have we've drastically changed. We've had such a great team uh, of people and they all are like-minded, you know, uh, having Adam and Ryan in your corner and, and, you know, being on the same team and everybody is, is doing their best to, um, to get a little further down the road, to raise the bar uh, higher the next day. That, that is, um, it was, it's beyond my wildest dreams, honestly, that we've, that we've got the team built that we, and we continue to grow it. Um, it's it's a man it's it's certainly been blessed that's for sure laura's been so good to us but um i'm, I'm looking forward to um you know teaming up with with this you know again like ron said distribution that, that was never on my radar right you know i never thought about you know he that's the wonderful thing about having that team is that people look at things from a completely different perspective and uh, and having those guys on, you know, there's a lot of things that I just never did look at. I never that's not the way my mind works. Um, 
And uh, that's, these things are getting addressed and they're getting uh, some really good solutions behind them. That's exciting. We just want to get it to the point where all you have to do every day is play on the CNC. (laughs) Come up with all these new ideas. Yeah, that's exactly what I want too. So yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I started to send you a picture. I sent you a picture and I, and I, uh, Adam of, of one of the, the tools that we're talking about that I made and I started to send and say thanks because, you know, it's because they are doing these things and holding the fort down that I get to now uh, step away and, and create products. And they're a part of that. They're the reason why that actually came to existence is because um, he's, you know, taking care of our customers and, and making sure that the ship stay in afloat and, you know, all these things are going on and everybody, you know, like I say, everybody has their base. Now they're actually, you know, when you, when you start a business, you wear so many different hats that it's just absolutely overwhelming. And, you know, you would love to throw it to first base, but nobody's there. You're the guy that throws it and the guy that catches it. Right. Um, so that's, that's a hard thing to do. But as you, I remember Terry Hedrick telling me one day, um, he's passed away now, but he used to tell me one day you'll build a team and you'll be able to do that. I thought never, I never will. It'll never happen, but it, you know, it's slowly, it's been a long process, but it's getting there. It's been really cool to watch. I remember doing a podcast with you years ago, Cass. And from that point to this one, the growth and, and just all the, it's really helping, you know, diesel truck owners, people who are listening to this podcast to be able to access the products and the expertise and the engineering. It's much more accessible now than it used to be. And what you guys talked about with lead time and being able to get stuff quicker, it is competing with Apple and Samsung and Amazon and these places where I order in the morning, I get it in the afternoon. That's what we're all becoming accustomed to. So to see that transition in automotive, specifically with diesel, is, oh, is can really I tell cool. you one of Cass's ideas? Oh, this is great. He calls me, and it wasn't late or anything. He's just like, hey, I have an idea. I'm like, what? He goes, I'm going to buy an airplane. I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, "He goes, yeah, they're not that expensive. I'm like, I don't know what that means, but go on. He goes, what if we had like a service we could sell to a customer, like an extra high-end warranty that if you ever had a problem with your engine, I'll just fly a tech out with another engine. We'll fix it on the side of the road, especially if I'm like, how about we just build a huge network of dealers and we can have a towed a few? But he was, I mean, that's just where his head was at. So you mentioned Amazon. I'm like, well, I guess we could have drone service. I said, like, wait, Cass already thought of that. He wanted to buy some Cessna. And it's like, this this one can hold can hold ten thousand pounds. <laughs> no, no, no. We need a Zodiac. Forget the Cessna turbo prop all the way. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, hey, you know what? Uh, you never know. Um, uh, you know, I, they, they say all the time, I. I look for, and this is honestly the truth of the matter. If I like, there's certain pieces of equipment that I, I'm just, man, I'm, I really have a, I really have a problem. Um, I love equipment. I mean, I love equipment. I mean, I just absolutely, I bought a, a grinder from 1940, ship from 1948, big 23,000 pound service grinder. I'm so excited to go get it. But um, anyway, I will look at something. I go, man, if I could design a part to pay for that machine, <laughs> that's the way, you know, yeah. my work. Like, right, but Hey, you know, you never know that Kodiak may be in the, in the works yet. There's a lot of opportunity out there. So. So for an extra $10,000 when you buy your Chote engine, if it ever fails, and uh, I'll fly. He'll, and fly, I'll fly. he'll fly out and personally fix it. So. <laughs> well, it was really cool to chat with you guys today. And uh, yeah, having uh, three guests on at once and, and and everything, it was it was really smooth, really cool, and man, I learned a lot on this one. There's a lot of good info, things I didn't know that'll definitely help me, and I know a lot of the listeners as well. Before they invest in you know repairing their truck or getting an engine, or maybe it's not even broken, they just want something better. The kind of questions to ask and everything. So I appreciate you guys taking the time this afternoon to chat with me, drop some knowledge, and help me understand more about engines. It's always waiting. fun. I'm just waiting for Ryan to say Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. No, I will not. <laughs> I will not. Uh, sh- shameless plug. Um, Ethan and I will be hitting the road quite a bit for events and dealer visits and trainings. If you want us in your front door, eross at chokeperformance.com or ryan at chokeperformance.com. And you'll be able to also go to chokeperformance.com to our events page. So if you want to come beat us up in the booth, you want a t-shirt, you want anything, we really want to see people on the road. That's how I can funnel info to Adam 
and then Adam can funnel it to Cass. And that's how we make our products better. Um, and that's how we make our company better and the experience better um, on every, every level, whether you're an existing or maybe a future customer. Don't forget, Diesel fans, make sure and head on over to Kershaw.kaiusa.com. Use code 2024Diesel40 for 40% off MSRP. It's a great way to save some money and get some cool gear if you're in the market for a knife or hunting, fishing, EDC, something around the job site, something around the house. They've got a ton of choices for different opening mechanisms, blade steel, blade shape, handle materials, and a whole lineup of knives to meet any budget. We really appreciate them offering that discount code just for you guys. Also, Target Sports USA. If you go to TargetSportsUSA.com, forward slash diesel pc it'll take you to their membership page and their membership page lasts a year it's 99 dollars. and on your first order you get a free cleaning kit plus you get entered into two really cool giveaways the first is an all expense paid hunting trip to colorado so it's six days includes airfare accommodations meals everything else um, also includes the guided hunt and licensing and complimentary meat processing and shipping back to you so it's a once a lifetime trip and uh, you spend six days in Colorado going elk hunting um, really cool giveaway we're excited about it plus you're also entered into win a free f-150 they give away a brand new truck every year great way to maybe score a uh, a new daily driver something to go you know point a to point b and so you're automatically entered into both of those plus you also get perks throughout the year you get eight percent off of listed prices and they also have specials where it goes to 16 percent. you get notified of in stock notifications first and plus there's free shipping whether you want one box or you're buying 20 boxes so a great way to save some money Till next time keep the shiny side up